angle slide deck. Yep. Wonderful. Yep. Thank you. So, USB leaders angle fourth line book hashtag that at Stellenbosch USB at USB at USB MBA. Please follow at JJ3 um, at Serial Hafuji at Picnodia USB. You can choose to follow me. Um, that would just clutter up your Twitter space. Mm -hmm. All right, we're heading on to four o'clock now. And I think it is, there's still some people coming in and I'll just right. wait for the signal from. Are you supposed to mute? Yes, please do mute yourself. The meeting is now streaming live on YouTube as well. And so let me formally welcome everybody. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be hosting today's event. I'd like to, at this stage, also thank the USB marketing team for assisting. Uh, it's wonderful to have all uh, a range of the authors here, as well as the editors of the book. Um, I am sure many of you want to engage with the speakers, and so I'm going to limit the time that I'm going to have to talk to you um, so that we can make sure that we do get an opportunity to engage uh, on such a meaty topic. Um, just an idea of the program and a summary of it. Uh, once I've concluded the welcome, I'll hand over to Professor Pitno Deer, who's the director of the uh, USB, We'll then move into the portion of remarks from Feriel Hafuji and Max Dubris. And uh, post that, I'll just briefly hand over to the editors for some comments um, and then head straight into the Q&A section, which I think is why we are all here to engage with these um, editors and authors. So Professor Pitno, dear, <coughs> is the director of the University of Stellenbosch Business School. He is a well-known academic, public speaker, and column writer. Before his appointment at the USB, he was Deputy Vice-Chancellor responsible for teaching and learning at the University of Northwest, oh, sorry, the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University in Port Elizabeth. He has more than 20 years of management experience at the university. He has published more than 100 articles uh, in academic journals and has presented at almost 150 national and international conferences and academic occasions on topics related to public ethics and forms of social justice. Prof. Nadia has received numerous awards nationally and internationally. He has an active public and conference speaking presence and is a consultant on value-driven organizations to many national companies and was a column writer for the last decade. In 2011, he was named the Vodacom Journalist of the Year. Professor Nadir, I'm going to hand over to you now for the opportunity just to contextualize the relevance of this book with regards to the University of Stellenbosch Business School. And then just some comments about your uh, interpretations and understandings of the reading. Mm. Thank you, Armand. Appreciate that. Uh, welcome, everyone. I see very famous faces online. I've never been in such an august occasion with people that you'd normally only see on TV and, you know, uh, perhaps in other public spheres. So a great honor to welcome you this afternoon to uh, USB, University of Stellenbosch Business School. It's a great pity that we have to meet online. The university just spent 144 million to upgrade our building. It's a really nice place. My stano leeg. There's only a few birds flying around the place. So it's a really waste of money, but uh, this is the best we can do. Yeah, why, why did I agree to, uh, to host this uh, launching this afternoon? Um, and may I immediately say to the authors and all the contributors that are, are in our meeting today, congratulations. Um, I know that Prof. Jansen, Jonathan, I can see you. You are a really good marketer, but prachtig. the timing of this book, I can't believe that you timed it so nicely. There must be some divine help. But um, uh, on a more serious note, it, the book appears in this week uh, on the cusp of both national and international uh, really, really hard debates about race uh, and other forms of isms in our uh, society. And, and I think why, why we at USB um, 
are really interested in this, despite the fact, Jonathan and Cyril, that the um, economic sciences, the agri sciences, the military sciences, and the engineering people have still not had a chance to make their contribution. I minutely went through the writers of the book, and uh, I think it's it, it, it's a uh, it's something that we need to talk going forward because I think in the economic sciences, we are just as much subject to the kind of pressures around, around this issue. But, but the, the reason why this is important to us is firstly is we, we, we are part of South Africa. Uh, there's not a magic wand that if you enter the gate in Balba Park campus that, and you go through the front door uh, bypassing our, our uh, receptionist, that you suddenly drop your presuppositions, your social formation, your prejudices, and your social form ideas that you have. Both our students and our academics and our international students, of which there are quite a number, uh, are subject to the same kind of socialization processes in South Africa. Therefore, there is no reason why we are not less prone uh, to racist attitudes, to dismissive gender attitudes, and even uh, other uh, sexual orientation issues. Uh, we are really, I think, not very much exposed to issues of classism because we're a privileged place. And disability is really not, has never been really big part of our thinking. You know, most people in South Africa would say disability, okay, you know, when I go to the OK Bazaar, I should not park on the wrong place. They don't understand the deep issues around that. So we part of South Africa and therefore the issues around the isms and in this case today racism is extremely important to us because we carry the same baggage and the same weight. But secondly, we also part of Stellenbosch University. And as I read the book, uh, I couldn't read every single article yet, but as I read the book, it, is, it was a direct response to the uh, specific article in the sports sciences. And we don't want to pick on them this afternoon. Clearly after that, it has been on earth much deeper in our history, Armand and others, and the inaugural lecture of Prof. Janssen to show that this is a deep seated epistemological uh, fault line, as it were, that runs through the history of Stellenbosch. And I always remind our international visitors that Stellenbosch just turned about 100 years, but um, for about 70 of those 100 years, uh, this is a university that was the Bakermat, as it were, for the kind of political thinking that informed the apartheid system. The first six prime ministers of the Republic all came from Stellenbosch, Hendrik Vervoert was in our sociological department, and my, I remind you, if you forget, that um, uh, the man who, who called the Groot Crocodile was at one point our chancellor. Um, but Stellenbosch always had this ambiguity in itself, uh, and I joined the university as a student in the late 80s, despite the fact that we were basically a project of, of, of Afrikaner empowerment. There was also the dissenting voices, the, the Piduplessis, the Pink Pits, the, the Nico Smit who resigned from the Quest School and went to Alexandra, uh, the Johan Degenaar who in a soft but very deep way challenges our way around folk and culture and, and rationality. Because of Stellenbosch uh, colleagues, uh, we share the same history and we are therefore subject to the same kind of prejudices and issues. And we are addressing that, uh, Armand, I won't speak longer than another four or five minutes. We really in our curricula try, and remember our students are all post experienced students. The, the average age of our students are in their 36, seven years old very much formed already in the idea. So it's a tough task in our curricula to really put these issues overtly uh, on the agenda. And um, we have had mixed successes. It's still a project uh, 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 in working where it, it, it will never be finished as it were. Uh, but to give you a sense, um, part of our leadership development program includes over discussions on race, diversity, on class, on gender. Um, it is a shame to say that uh, the, the business school was 52 years old before the first woman was appointed as a full professor. It incidentally happened under my tenure, but I don't take credit for that. Um, uh, we are a 76% of our total staff is women, but if you look at the leadership positions, it's very much still uh, a male dominated uh, 
society. And uh, because of we want to try and, 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 and curb this tendency, uh, we last year with our own funding set up a chair to study the question of, of women in business. When it comes to class, I think USB suffers from the same amnesia as most South Africans. We're very, very uncomfortable uh, with poor people. That's why very few people of lower social status ever come on our campus. But also that we've tried to to change around by bringing our small business academy people, our social responsibility activities, engage our students across the class divide so that we conscientize them to the broader realities of South Africa. So that's the first point. There's a social reason why USB as part of the economic and social sciences, as part of Stellenbosch University, as part of South Africa, have simply to address uh, these issues. And then secondly, uh, Armand, and with that I close, uh, there's also a research reason. Uh, Prof. Jonathan, it is very, very interesting that almost every single form of economic data in South Africa is broken down into race categories. Unemployment data, black, Indian, colored, white. Income data, black, Indian, colored, white. Social grants data, black, Indian, colored, white. Membership of boards of listed companies, black, colored, Indian, whites. Uh, uh, Post-school qualifications, job level data, and so I can go on. So the, the very research domain of the economics is in a way deeply, deeply uh, in trenched to think in, in racial categories. And what this does to us that function in this kind of social science environment is that the data start to play the role where they confirm your deepest prejudices about others. So who's corrupt in South Africa? Black people. Who are poor in South Africa? Black people. And then what we do with those who, 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 who do not fit the, the category, we say, well, they are, they are now very serious exceptions. I mean, you do find people like Jonathan Jansen, but you know, he's just sort of once in a million. Uh, the real, the real uh, black and colored and Indian people are different. So uh, we, what this does is it brings into economic research the same racial essentialism and uh, if it goes further, racial determinism that we find elsewhere. And, and I must say, it's a very important academic project that this book encourages us to engage in. And this is to question the epistemological bias of the work that we do. And we at USD do massive research. We've got about 600 master's treatises per year. We graduate between 12 and 18 doctoral students per year. And these questions, Jonathan and, and, and Cyril, and other colleagues that contributed to the book, thank you for helping us to think through this issue. We want to take it extremely seriously because we want to create a space where there's epistemological honesty, where truth is really questioned and we, we contribute to the deracialization of the South African society. Congratulations. Uh, if you give us a discount, we prescribe the book. I think we'll sell quite a number of them in the business school. Go well, colleagues. Thank you, Armand. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Pitt. Um... And uh, Albert, if you don't mind not sharing your screen there, um, uh, since you've been so efficient with your time, Jonathan, I'm not sure if you wanted to do briefly respond, do you have, uh, or would you like to hold that off till later? I just want to correct Pete on one thing. Uh, I'll respond more detail uh, in more detail. Pete, first of all, thank you very much for taking your time, but I, I need to correct you on something very serious. Uh, P.W. Boerta was actually a Kofsi, and it, <laughs> it, 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 but it doesn't say much for Martis that a, a, a dropout from the Free State became Chancellor of yeah. Stellenbosch, but that's yeah. another debate. <laughs> yeah. No, I simply wanted to illustrate that for a long part, uh, we were just as much a slave to the ideology at the time, trying to buy favor with the politicians. You know, now we try to do it with the business people, but that's a different story. Oh, cool. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, Albert, um, you managing to share your screen a number of times. Uh, so th thank you very much, Pitt. Um, thanks, Jonathan. Jonathan, for that brief response. I'd just like you to also um, have a look. If you see in the chat column, there's some questions flowing already. 
please make use of that. We'll try and keep track of the themes that are coming through, where it is that we can ask those questions later on and allow for the opportunity to engage, we'll do so. What I'd like to do now is hand over to Feril Hafiji. Um, she's a journalist and associate editor at the Daily Maverick. Feril Hafiji is, a, is currently uh, uh, the associate editor at the Daily Maverick. Um, previously, she was the editor-in-chief at the Mail and Guardian and City Press. She's a regular analyst and commentator on radio and television. Uh, she has won numerous awards for journalism and for support for media freedom. She was also chairperson of the South African National Editors Forum and chairperson of the CNN Multi-Choice African Journalist of the Year Awards, and has served on the boards of the World Editors Forum and the Global Editors Network. She has published a best-selling book called What If There Were No Whites in South Africa? and in 2017 was awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Free State for her journalism. I think we might have to also look into this. Feriel, over to you. And if you could give us some insight, um, the personal experience of reading this book, the relevance you see um, to society now, with all that's happening globally, how timely is this book? Sure. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be with you all. So I really enjoyed it and I thought I might just put up the proof of that. You can see all the way through red. Um, and the reason I enjoyed it so much is that I was really provoked, Aman, by the Nikoli Natras affair at UCT University. And I didn't know how to approach it because, um, Prof. Jonathan, I disagree that it's primarily an issue of academic freedom. I think it's much more than that, and I hope to talk about some of that. But just to the book, I really loved learning from the literal skeletons in the closet, from the meaning of the song in the wind, um, to the, uh, the ideology of folks' hoskidiness. I didn't know those things. So thank you very much to the editors and authors for helping me to locate this um, natural affair um, into a very relevant context. So I'll be honest with you, when I read about the sports science article on News 24 last year, I wasn't provoked by it. Um, in fact, I don't even think I got to the bottom of the news article about it because I know my life and I know myth from fact. And so my life was one growing up in Bosmont in Johannesburg. And it was about strong women who held up communities and who made a generation of us in spite of and not because of our circumstances. So I don't need to tell you about the doctors, the lawyers, the teachers, the professors, the many wonderful people who came out of communities like mine. And neither do I have to tell you about the cognitive smarts, the social smarts, the physical smarts of what it took to run homes to bring up children to put fabulous food on the table, um, to take your children to school, to university, when an entire system was pivoted against you. But when I think that maybe I don't have to tell you those things, when I look at that sports science research and the paucity of it, where five researchers came up with a piece of um, work that by rights, I think, has been uh, rescinded, then it told me that they live in a lager and that they don't get out of their own communities very much. The naturalist research showed a similar thing to me. It was about being in a lager. And at the end, I'll return to the theme of the lager because I think whereas our constitution enjoins us to be something else, in fact, we are retreating into lagers far and far more often. So I'll return to the naturalist research. And for me, it would be tragic if it wasn't so funny. So I do think that the professor was prodded by an administration to color up your class. I wanna see more diversity in IC Wild. So what did, what did she do? She sent junior researchers out at lunch and they asked 112 students whether they had pets, whether they wanted to study conservation, whether they believed roads must fall and whether they put land reform above um, national parks or conservation. Um, 
So at a city campus in the thrall of an awful fallless dogma, stupid questions like those were going to beget the stupid answers that she got into a piece of research, which for me is quite deformative. And I think Prof Natras knows that. And so we sit with these three, three pages of work, which finds that black students in the main are materialistic and not really interested in the, national, in the natural sciences. Like I said, Prof, earlier, I know that you've said this is an issue of academic freedom, and that's what most of the pieces I've read have been about. It's likely to be key when the journal brings out its, its responding version to Nikli Natras's research. But I think that there are other reasons we should raise our voices um, against the research while, of course, standing up for the rights to academic freedom. I'll just also show you how very easy it was to debunk that research. So all I did was call up Sand Parks and because I know about the people in Parks projects, I know that these are not such crude binaries. And what I found out there is that 13 of our 20 beautiful national parks are now headed by black South African park managers. I also found out that all of the senior black uh, senior conservationists at Sand Parks are black South Africans. Um, what the, um, Dr. Lutando Ziba told me as well is that many of those people have, faith, have been attempted poaching. People have not real poaching. They wanted to take them to the universities or wherever at much higher salaries. And in fact, they want to stay doing the jobs that they do. So it was quite easy to debunk the naturalist research with fact. Um, and to show why I think that kind of crude science-based research really is passe and should be on its way out across our campuses. Um, when I looked at the book, it's ultimately the work, everything was a, a real learning curve for me. But what I truly loved was um, Cecilia Jacobs, because like you, I'm a scholar of uh, Professor, Professor Neville Alexander. I've always grown up. Uh, calling myself a black South African, not a colored South African. And now I really want to just be a human South African, obviously to Crane Sodine, um, to Professor Moodley, thank you for teaching me all you did in that reading about the ethics of research. Jonathan Jansen, the opening paragraphs I quote extensively in the package I'm, I'm writing, and then also Anita Yonker. Because I think what those authors do is they provoke us to think about what does non-racialism mean in the 21st century? Our constitution enjoins us to build a non-racial society, but I think we're doing a terrible, terrible job. Where I've worked, where I've been, I think people too easily assume that non-racialism means not seeing race. It does mean respecting diversity and ensuring diversity. So the other big issue we sat with this week was the Media 24 judging panel, books judging panel, which was 95% white, and that has caused another a minor, a, a minor kerfuffle. It also means moving toward a society where race is no longer the first determinant or the first identity. And what I hope the book begins to usher in is to bring think about what does a working non-racialism mean in the 21st century in South Africa, but also in the world. And then as uh, Prof Pitt said, we find ourselves at a moment where there's a very forceful reckoning with the past, not only in South Africa, but everywhere on the hashtag Black Lives Matter. And for me, what Black Lives Matter um, demands of us is not only a commitment to the, narrow, the loose concept of diversity or to non-racialism, but to a very active anti-racism. And I think the book begins to prod us in that direction. So thank you very much for including me, but also letting me um, read your fine work. Thanks so much, Amanda. I hope I'm within time. Thanks, Gadiel. You're well within time. And before I, I'm actually just going to ask you another question, and may, you might think about it. I'd like to know your experience as a woman having engaged with uh, this particular book. Uh, I'm not sure how much you went into Barbara Boswell and Anita Hose's chapter. Um, looking at it from a feminist perspective, um, because we still have some time. I'd just like to hear your views on that. But while you're thinking about that, let me just share some of the questions that are on the chats. 
and some of the comments. And here's one from Feroz Khan. Many of your students and graduates, and uh, I think this is directed at USD, many of your students and graduates complain bitterly about a historical decontextualized and Eurocentric nature of your pedagogy, not dissimilar to the revolts against from the financial crisis as in post autistic economics and now everywhere. And then from YouTube, Terrell Christians. Yes, but USB only sets aside two to four sessions in that leadership module to talk about race and sex. Much more time needs to be spent on these issues, but we can't, can, can't not look at these categories as they are still major divides in our economy. As managers, if we talk about these issues in the business school, then how can we expect to manage discussions in the workplace? Uh, so those are some of the comments. Uh, Feril, if you'd like to just respond to that question about as a woman, uh, your interpretation and understanding. I'm glad I don't have to answer those other comments um, in the chat. That's for the faculty to do so. Um, I, I suppose I, I, I love the Barbara Boswell and, and other chapters. And they kind of, um, again, to me, because I come from like the world of Diane Ferris, Barbara Boswell, et cetera, um, I guess my approach to, to the findings were quite different because I was just like, oh, you're talking rubbish when I know those women, I, I am them, I grew up with them, I'm their daughter, their granddaughter. Um, but I guess we have to, what it did teach me is we have to more forcefully stand up for the legacy, et cetera, um, of women. And I was very inspired by the professor and um, Professor Cyr and Cyril's chapters on misery research and I guess a lot of my work has been to um, present people in different ways be it the little black book be it the book of South African women or the 200 young South Africans you must take to lunch is um, those are very those were very activist projects Aman to insist on different representation um, for previously oppressed people what I found particularly interesting, uh, Feriel, about Barbara's chapter and a lot of where this book has come to um, was stimulated by her engagement and understanding of the article. But what I found really intriguing about her chapter was how she named who the perp perpetrator is. Um, and the notion of white supremacy comes uh, to the fore quite uh, prominently in her chapter. And I really appreciated that fact of naming who the perpetrator is. We generally tend to use the terms racism and even the, um, as you'll find throughout the book, um, the notion of racism doesn't name who's perpetrating the violence. Um, would you like to comment on that before I hand over to Max? I do, I, I, wrote, a, I wrote a whole book about that. It's called, um, it wasn't a very um, popular book. Um, it is called, What If There Were No Whites in South Africa, where I, I discount the theory that we live in a, a society of white supremacy, precisely because I'm an adherent to its constitution. I see empowerment, good empowerment happening everywhere. So I, I disagree with that. Eh? Um, it didn't make me friends when I did so though. And that's the good thing about this book. I think it's going to have many people evaluating their role in society, the way that they see the academy um, from different perspectives. Um, at this stage, I'd like to move on to um, Max Dupree, uh, a journalist, author, and political analyst. He, as we all know him, and he's also not very popular with some parts of uh, the community. Max, I follow you on Twitter. It's always enjoyable to see uh, how it is that people discount your role in uh, changing South Africa and the assumptions that, that they make. But he's best recognized for his work as, as the founding editor of Freya Vierpark, an Afrikaans language anti-apartheid newspaper. He's also known for having served as a political correspondent for Build Financial Mail and the Sunday Times. He has won several awards for his reporting work, including the Nat Nakasa Award for Fearless Reporting in 2008. Max, your thoughts uh, of engaging with this book, its relevance, um, mm -hmm. how it, it sits in society? Yeah, I thank you, Arnold. Um, when uh, people read, uh, say kind words about me like you just did. I always remember um, 
that a, a couple of years ago, I went to uh, Loftus Fassfeld to watch a game between the Stormers and the Bulls. And I got there a bit late. And so I was walking up the, uh, the stands and I'm not the favorite son of Pretoria, I must add. And I could feel the eyes on my, the back of my head. And then eventually I got to my seat and I sat down and there was this big guy with bull horns on his head who stood up and stretched out his hands and he shouted, hey, oh, Max. And I thought, okay, I found my people, you know, at least someone loves me. And I said, hello, Mark. And he said, yo, oh, Popo. And everybody cheered him. So I know, I know where I fit into the society. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm glad, Max, that you've managed to use the word Popo uh, <laughs> and that I could repeat it. Um, yeah, I was also reminded by Pete uh, that, you know, I'm a Stellenbosch University alumna, alumnus. And uh, on the weekend, my last Lamiki is a teenage of 15. And when I got engaged, well, she picked up that I was engaged in, in a little bit of a Twitter war around uh, apartheid legislation, uh, race legislation being more prodigious now than before. And she asked me to explain. And I had to tell her um, that when I went to Stellenbosch University, there were only white people. The strangers there were English speakers, but most of us were Afrikaans. And I explained to her that uh, Breiton Breitenbach once said that, Afrika that Stellenbosch was the debakermat van Afrikaner dom, waar Afrikaners dom gemaakt wordt. I'm happy to know that Stellenbosch is not like that anymore. Um, Amand, before I get into uh, the book itself, let me entertain you with uh, something else. Uh, I'm a collector of old books uh, on South African history and politics and culture and language. And on the weekend, I was paging through uh, some of these books and I came upon two snippets relevant to our conversation today that I want to share with you. The first is a 1924 book by the famous Afrikaans academic uh, writer, poet, D.F. Malerba, then professor of Afrikaans at the Gray University College, which became Free State University. Uh, the book is called um, Afrikaans Spreekwoorde in Verwante Forme. So Malerba was rather obsessed with making the case that Afrikaans as spoken by white Afrikaners was a language on a par with the older established languages of the West. And I wanna quote this part and forgive me for those, those who can't understand Afrikaans, it's not really translatable. He says, ook in sy verhouding tot swart en gekleerde rasse, vergelijk die Afrikaanse folk met ander Europe Europese volke meer as gunstig. And then he quotes an Afrikaans saying that went like this. As jy a paar tree achter uitloop, trap jy op ou Alida se kop. And he says, this is gesê van iemand met onsever bloed. Now the name Alida has an asterisk and in a footnote he explains, naam van a swart of kleerling meid. He continues, omring van allerlei gekleerde rasse in oorweldigende getalle. It's a hohe sedelike levensstandaard en meerderheidsgevoel die Afrikaanse volk in staat gestel om sy rasse suiverheid voorbeeldig te aanbouw, nie teenstaande lastelike aantegingen van vijandig gesindekat. I mean, it's almost uh, comical. And yet, uh, Dave Malerbe uh, was uh, a highly recognized writer and poet until uh, well into my adulthood. Now, the second book uh, that I paged through was published in 1804. An account, it's called An Account of the Travels into the Interior of South Africa by Sir John Barrow. Now, Barrow was the founder of the Royal Geograph Geographic Society, which of course still exists in Britain as a very prestigious collection of intellectuals. So Barrow described Afrikaners as, quote, backward, indolent, and cruel race. And he has this tasty description of the typical Afrikaner peasant. He could have been speaking about my great grandfather. 
Quote, his pipe scarcely ever quits his mouth from the moment he rises till he retires to rest, except to give him time to swallow his swoopy or a glass of strong ardent spirit, to eat his meals and to take a man nap after dinner. Unwilling to work and unable to think with a mind disengaged from every sort of care and reflection, indulging to excess in the gratification of every sensual appetite. The peasant grows to an unwieldy size and is carried off the stage by the first inflammatory disease that attacks him. I thought I would entertain you with those uh, little quotes to see where we come from. So yeah, as, as Pete said, and you said uh, about the, the timing of the Voltaire's book could not have been better. And, and even though the authors, of course, could have no idea that its publication would coincide with this extraordinary worldwide Black Lives Matter movement unleashed by the murder of George Floyd. I'm a bit of a cynic when it comes to human beings' ability to change in a short period of time, but the scale and intensity of the present movement suggest history will one day point out that this was a moment where attitudes and sensitivities around race had shifted meaningfully, and I hope it will have an impact on us in South Africa. You know, when the NASCAR bosses banned Confederate symbols and American and European legislations and European soccer players take the knee in public, you know things won't be the same again. And this is how we roll as human beings. Things can go wrong for a very long time, but we only sit up and notice and change when something dramatic happens that gets lots of media coverage. I mean, we all knew about police brutality against black Americans. But we had to sit and watch the movie of George Floyd getting murdered on television and on YouTube to get us going. Mm -hmm. The statues of King Leopold of Belgium and the British slave traders were offensive many, many years ago, but it took the present revolution to have them removed. And the same was true of the event that stimulated the writing of this book, the shocking publication by five Stellenbosch academics of a paper on so-called colored women so I think the fault lines is a, is a proper and brilliant, appropriate response to that event. And I really hope it will lead to a fundamental rethink by all researchers on how we should continuously reconsider our approach and examine our preconceived ideas without, of course, becoming so scared of political correctness, correctness that we don't tackle some topics head on. But I hope this book will have a wider impact than just on researchers and academics. I trust Amant, that a copy of the book has already been delivered to the home of the chairperson of the Federal Council of the Democratic Alliance. Please also deliver copies to Revolutionary House, the headquarters of the EFA. It is a book that ought to be read by all politicians and public intellectuals, commentators, analysts, and yes, journalists. I think in South Africa, the, the entire concept of race as a social construct appears to be counterintuitive. Our obsession with race started with the arrival of the first European settlers at the Cape. Given the blessings my Christianity ask me, I come from a Christian Afrikaner mm -hmm. national background and was intellectualized and enforced by the architects of apartheid and continues to this day. Most South Africans cannot distinguish between race on the one hand and ethnicity and culture on the other. We, and that is you as academics, and we, Ferial and I, as media practitioners, have the task of helping our society to truly unlearn race. Our task is to, in simple language, unpack the approaches of social constructionists, race realists, race, uh, critical race theorists, and others, and, and make it understandable. We need to explain uh, that the new mantra of so many white people that they are colorblind, so stop talking about race all the time, that it's more about denialism than a noble post-race state of mind. We need to explore and explain the differences between multiracialism and non-racialism. In fact, uh, a new thorough discourse on the true meaning of non-racialism as written into chapter one of our constitution is now really overdue. We need to to strip away the layers of fake intellectual, intellectual camouflage used by the likes of AfriForum and, may I add, the EFF to hide their primitive views on race and history. 
Sometimes we need to accuse and confront. More often, we need to explain. Now, those of you who know me will know that I am rather more comfortable with and used to confronting and accusing. But now in my later decades, I occasionally see the advantage of taking a slightly softer approach and helping especially white people to not resort to defensiveness as first reaction, but to understand and empathize and look deep into their own hearts. I really want to congratulate and thank the, order, uh, the editors and contributors of Fault Lines. And I challenge you as I challenge my colleagues in the media to seize the momentum of the present cultural revolution, to explore and explain this complex problem, to help South Africans to reevaluate their own ideas on race. Academics, may I say, often suffer from the same tendency as journalists. We write to impress our own colleagues. The state, the, the poor state uh, of our national discourse is the result. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Max. Um, by some of those comments, I realized that you're an optimist. Um, we can deliver a hundred books to the door and I'm not quite sure we're going to win that battle. Mm -hmm. But you speak to a particular issue uh, closer to the end there in terms of the defensiveness that white people uh, take. Uh, and I had a, uh, an, a, a chat early on with a colleague of mine. And I think what people forget is, is that it's not an us and a them issue to solve. It is an all of us issue to address. Um, so can you just give me a little bit more about um, the role that white people can actually play in society um, in addressing um, the issues that we are, are confronting here today? Yeah, that, that's a minefield in, it, minefield in itself, because whenever there is a, I mean, we saw it now with COVID-19, where there's a, an effort of white people, some white people to come forward and try and help there's a voice somewhere that says, uh, we don't want your charity. Stay out of our way, you know? So I, I sometimes sympathize because not many people have a thick skin like I do. Sympathize with people who are a bit baffled, who have, they think, good intentions, but it's not received very well on the other side. And so it's tricky um, for white South Africans, especially those who haven't been, surrounded by political activists, to make sense of when should they speak, when should they just shut up, and, and when should they, are they allowed to say something and how should they say it? And I think it's, it's a good thing, and I, I do a lot, I think, to try and help people understand. Uh, when you speak, um, this is what you should look out for. And I, I often think um, when I talk to people like that, that I've had this discussion with Helen Ziller and I, I said to her, isn't it important? Because she kept on saying, well, I'm speaking the truth. And I said, well, it may be your truth, but isn't what is more important, how you speak, how that will be received by the other parties? Because if, if people just give you a middle finger and they feel offended, you have failed. So I think that that is part of it. On, on, the, on the issue of of confronting and accusing. I think uh, I, I'm, I've been pretty good at that in my lifetime. Um, but I think the harder way is the better way, is, is to liberate, to help, and I'm not asking black South Africans to liberate white people. I'm saying we should liberate ourselves in the sense of do not, um, your first reaction should not be to defend your group, yourself. It is liberating for white people to condemn things like we happened in our society in the last 72 hours. To say, I am not like that. Onsisni uh, almal suni. You can, you can condemn uh, white racism uh, without condemning yourself. So we, we just need, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are now yawning saying, well, they go the whites, it's all about them. And I have sympathy with that. But being white myself, I, I sometimes have a sympathy that, that I have a role to explain these things. And the book, Folk Lines, has been extremely helpful to me um, to be able to formulate those kind of ideas and say, 
uh, I'm not saying you're a bad guy, but but let's look at where this fits in, and maybe you will you'll change your thinking. Thanks, Max. I would encourage you all to get a book. There's so many places that I've connected with the book um, personally, not only as a uh, I'll, I'll say a pseudo academic because I'm an activist first, Max, I'm going to claim that. Um, can I just read some of the comments that we've got going there? Uh, Cleve Robertson, uh, in addressing these issues, how do we address the very hard structural inequalities in essay? I believe our physical and built environment is an important factor. Uh, Francois Kiofas, race, class and gender is often thought of differently up to 1994. Race and class and gender is still as virulent, even more so in 20, well, I think that's 2020, should be 2020. I'm glad he's a year ahead of us. Jesse Albach, I'd be curious to hear the author's thoughts on friendship. Will symbolic changes be enough without deep friendships between people from different backgrounds that allow the micro conversations and realizations uh, so important to transformation. I'd agree with Ferial that there is a tendency to move back into lagers when people get frightened and there is a lot to be afraid of in the world right now. In your work, and please forgive me for not having read the book fully, how if at all has the work of friendship emerged? Ferial, I'm actually going to give you a quick second there before I ask Jonathan and uh, Cyril as the editors. We might have lost our month. I yep. think. I think. Fairly, I think he wants you to. To this is speed speaking. I think uh, he I wants think. you to comment on the idea of the micro, the friendship idea, breaking down the big structures into the local, the the, the personal. Obviously, that is um, a belief system I've always worked with in my own life, and I think that. Um, so, so not to be rude to Media Twenty Four because I've I had very great years there but i think what happened with that media 24 book judging panel at the at the weekend when i spoke to people because obviously i wrote to them and i said come on guys you you have to do better than this it was clear to me that people didn't know networks that they simply didn't know this beautiful literary scene we have in south africa with the world's leading authors, critics, um, book circles of, of, of women, um, that they simply had no ideas. They hadn't been able to or wanted to break out of their lagers to know this larger world. And I do think those are personal and political, it's personal politics uh, for you to do that. But obviously, I don't think that just those small steps are going to take us there. It has to be a much bigger rethink. And for me, that rethink isn't the destructive, flawless politics. I think what one of the authors call a racial essentialism. It is about thinking through how does a genuine working non-racial society works because an ANC, a great ANC, which bequeathed this notion ahead of its time to us, really has not spent any philosophical or political attention in working out how does non-racialism operate in a 21st century society with the fissures that, that we have and which we see um, almost every day fit. Thank you, Feryl. Is, is Armand back online? Yes, thank you very much, Pitt. You did, uh, I assume you stepped in there like a true leader would. Um, and I appreciate that very much. I'm so glad you've got my back. Uh, by the way, Pitt, um, I actually have a master's degree in disability studies and I come from uh, the, um, the school um, that we were talking about. Um, so there's a number of intersections that I'd like to, when we get into the Q&A, also explore further with the authors. Uh, Jonathan uh, Cyril, I'd like for you now uh, just to have an opportunity to maybe reflect on uh, or comment on uh, both what Ferial uh, and Max had to say, and maybe also some commentary for Pitt, um, and then also maybe um, a little bit more as you feel you need. So I'll hand over to uh, Jonathan. 
Okay, I'll start and then uh, hand over to Cyril. <clears throat> Let me just say, first of all, thank you very, very much to Max and, and Virio. I, I was, I was, I have huge respect for the two of them as journalists who stood their ground uh, under apartheid and, and since. Um, and uh, they've been role models for me to look up to. So when they both said yes to being on today, I was incredibly excited. So uh, thank you very much to both of you. Um, the second thing I just want to do is to say thank you to uh, my uh, fellow editor, Cyril. She normally does the hard work and <laughs> on, on these book projects. And uh, this is her first book, so I also wanted to say to her congratulations. So this is, uh, this is amazing, and, and I know you will do a lot more. Um, I want to say to all the authors uh, that when we started the book project, um, uh, I honest, I thought we'd get good, you know, they were good scholars uh, like Amanda and Barbara and, and, and many others. Uh, so I knew it would be good, but I didn't expect, you know, to be blown away by things that, as somebody who studies the disciplines uh, 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 for a living, uh, I never thought, I honestly didn't think that theology, theology of all things, in an African, historically African university, would give us such a profound account, you know, of the complicity of translators, for example, in uh, the production of, of identities such as Buster. Uh, I, I, I couldn't see that coming, not from theology. Um, uh, secondly, I, uh, I think one of the best chapters I've ever read in my life is the chapter by uh, 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 Stephanus and, and Wilhelmin on music, on music's complicity <laughs> in the production of racial knowledge. Who would have thought that, you know? Uh, there is an outstanding chapter by Kay Woodley on, on ethics that I think if you just took that chapter out, you should have it. Whenever you do research, just read it uh, as, 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 as a warning. I wish that Nikki Natras had that uh, in hand uh, when she did her, her piece. So I just I wanted to, to say I'm incredibly proud with my co-editor to have worked with these authors and with our outstanding uh, um, uh, uh, internal editor uh, in, in uh, William Daniels, who day and night in the United States would be available for us as we traded various drafts of the various chapters. I do want to thank Vikas van Sale of Sun Media, who's just been an absolute pillar uh, in, in bringing this book to fruition, and to uh, my friend Rodney Maharaj from Associated Printing, who, you know, on his own said, I will produce another 500 copies for you from my printer. So we've just had incredible support. And, and I just wanted to say thank you to, to all of those uh, folk. And again, Pip, thank you for your uh, Baydra. I think the, the, I just want to leave you a thought. Um, one of the things that, that's always struck me about a crisis around the race in South Africa, particularly where I've worked. This is through the University of the Free State where I came after the race incident. It's been through with the Tablanche study, which this book is based on, the Blanche, Professor the Blanche and her colleagues, is that when you talk to people about, uh, you know, really terrible research with, with or terrible racist actions and, and, and when I look those four boys in the eye, as I did often uh, in Bloemfontein, or when you listen to interviews with uh, Professor de Blanche in particular, what they say in response to the crisis they provoke is, what did we do wrong? Now, initially, my gut reaction was to say, for heaven's sake, get real. And then I realized these were really genuine responses. Now, as black people in particular, we, we don't have much patience, you know, with uh, people who uh, respond by saying, I really don't know what I did wrong. And, and, you know, the more I thought about that over the past uh, 10 years or so, the more I realized that that is true, that my colleagues, my friends, my uh, students really don't know what they did wrong. In other words, there isn't a moral consciousness that kicks in that says, oh my gosh, you know, this is horrible. And unless we understand that Max is correct, 
you're not going to change the behavior. It can't change. And that is why our response to Nikki Natalis's article was not to say clamp down on it and, and outstand any day uh, for academic freedom, uh, even though I agree with Firio, that is a, a part of the problem. There's some other deeper issues. But, but the issue is how do you educationally address these issues for people who scream at each other when it comes to issues of race or deny culpability? I think we need to deal with this as an educational matter. So I have said to Professor Wim de Villiers, who is our Vice Chancellor at Stellenbosch, I said, Wim, here is an ideal opportunity to make this book. None of us are going to benefit from it financially. Otherwise, I wouldn't make the recommendation. Make this part of the core curriculum for all undergraduates. The Senate has said this should happen anyway. And I'm hoping the university will do that uh, because you're still going to have racist acts in our country. We've been in this for 300 years. And, and, and therefore, you need to get out of this dilemma educationally. You can't get out of this politically only by charging people and accusing people. And that is why um, I proposed to the editor of the South African Journal of Science, even though I have no authority there, uh, as the president of ASIF, I said, listen, the worst thing you can do is to retract this article because then it disappears. What you need to do is to keep the article and have people, I think there's about seven or eight people who have written powerful responses to that article in order to have this debate that addresses the question, what did I do wrong? The way for our young people, the way for older people is to talk through this. And then finally, just from my side, uh, this is a question South Africans are never going to get out of, and that is, how do you talk about race without bringing it up? Let me re repeat that. How do we talk about race without bringing it up? And I think uh, we've just written a different book, uh, myself and uh, Samantha Krieger, on, um, on 30 elite schools in the, southern, in the southern suburbs of Cape Town. It's scary. It really is scary. It should be out next month, I think. But their schools have figured out how to talk about race and never bring it up, okay? And yet they have schools with 80% white kids, you know, two and a half decades after apartheid. That is Jonathan, scary. And Jonathan, finally, I... finally, if I can just quickly wrap this point up, uh, Armand, um, uh, the, the, the answer to that I've learned from, from Neville Alexander, who Firio uh, mentioned earlier, and that is you've got to separate out race as a biological category, which is, of course, a myth, from race as a social category. That is the way race organizes our lives, whether we like it or not. Okay, And that, I think, is at the heart of uh, uh, this is how we get out of this thing educationally rather than um, uh, just politically. Sorry, Armand. No, no worries, Jonathan. Uh, um, I figured that I was going to have the opportunity to introduce you more formally, and that was just going to be a, uh, a summary, but it sets the tone for the discussions to come. Can I just share some of the comments that um, I've got here? Uh, Max, you'll be happy to know that Christian Berger, I can meet om na jou te luister, Max. Um, and then Sancho Fairweather, if you just go into the chat box, she's left a, a link towards the Jeppy Boy's high deputy principal, um, his speech on white privilege. He suggests that everyone should read that. There's a letter Smith, the single most important thing you can do is to shift your internal stance from I understand to help me understand. Everything else follows from that. And that's a quote from Douglas yeah. Stone. Is it YouTube um, done a good to manage? Uh, uh, Albert, if you don't mind. Mia. Yeah. Robert from me, I believe. All right. Uh, <laughs> Leratu, Mark, uh, we will not have, make any headway on the race issue without being uncomfortable. Both white and black people have to be uncomfortable and be honest. We need the TRC as the previous one failed the society or we wouldn't be where we are in the 21st century. I'd like to move to Cyril and uh, let me uh, Cyril, uh, Jonathan, you won't mind if I do a more formal introduction to Cyril. Uh, 
Cyril Walters teaches on the MBA program at the University of Stellenbosch Business School and is a postdoctoral research fellow in higher education studies at Stellenbosch University. She is a scholar of organizations with a special interest in complexity theories of leadership and institutional theories of curriculum. She is co-author of a forthcoming book, as Jonathan mentioned, uh, um, on the uptake of decolonization with South, within South African universities. But beyond that, I have the absolute joy to say that she is a dear friend, a wonderful uh, mother, and a really exceptional scholar. Uh, Cyril, over to you. Oh, I remind, I didn't expect such a formal introduction, but thank you. Everyone has been wonderful and everyone has said so much. I think I just want to probably just tie in what Jonathan mentioned about um, this sort of ignorance. I don't know what I did or what did I say? And um, Jonathan, I think if we, if we talk about fault lines, it would be remiss of us not to mention Angela Saini's book, um, superior, the return of race science, which has been an absolute phenomenal eye-opening read for me. But she touches on ignorance, and and she 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 says yes, ignorance probably is part of the problem. They are ignorant authors, but the problem is not only ignorance, because the problem is that even when people know the facts, not actually everybody wants things to change, and they don't want race science to go away. And so this means that those committed to the biological reality won't back down. Um, there's no incentive to admit any sort of intellectual defeat. So ignorance is, is, is part of it, but she told me that even if people know that it's wrong, there's absolutely no reason for them to commit. The other thing, I mean, we've spoken about the, the Nikki Natchez issue. But what was interesting for me about Natchez and Stellenbosch and the one similarity I think that that hit me was just the incredulity of the authors. I really got the sense that they genuinely were surprised by the response. And so um, I, I've been trying to figure out why and, the, and for me the ignorance issue comes in. Um, I think that it's also important to note that we, we speak about these two universities, but what Saini's book really powerfully demonstrates is that race science is just not limited to these two universities. Um, actually, it's stepping down into mainstream academia globally. She mentions universities, she mentions publishers like Elsevier. She explains the structures and the networks keeping these ideas alive and um, these networks are resilient and how these ideas of you know develop and promoted in discrete ways. So we we're talking about our university, about UCT, but this is coming into mainstream academia across the world more than ever before. And um, so I think that is important to note. But thank you, Jonathan, for reaching out to me to co-edit with you and to all our wonderful authors. It's it's been an absolute pleasure and a wonderful journey to me. Thank you. Thank you, Cyril. I think now's the time. I see some of the questions coming through and there are some tough ones I'd like us to engage with, but let me have um, the first go at it. Uh, Jonathan, um, in your introduction, you described the university management evolution of outrage, and I, I'm going to read it here. The university management showed an evolution of outrage that started with an appeal, and you quote them, rigorous discussion and critical debate, and that's on the 24th of April. You then proceed to say that on the 30th of April, they used the words unconditional apology. We move beyond that to the 21st of May, and the words that are used is disbelief, appalled, saddened, and these two words, particularly for me, wrong and indefensible. We fast forward onto the 12th of June and the university issues a statement titled Update on Outcome of Formal Investigation. And I think also, Professor Moodley, if you just, um, uh, I'm going to direct part of this question to you. A formal investigation committee was therefore appointed to investigate various aspects related to the article. 
the FIC concluded that the article was not no, aligned with the Research Ethics Committee approved protocol. The FIC furthermore concluded that there had been no indication to the REC that the results of the study would be presented in terms of racial generalizations. And they had not approved the study as such. They exonerated the REC from, and the words they use is wrongdoing and or any negligence. They proceed to address uh, the authors. The FIC could not find any deliberate intent to mislead the relevant role players, nor any malevolence behind the writing of the article. The researchers naively regarded the content of the article as compatible with the research trends in their discipline. So Professor Moodley, in your chapter, you present a number of cases which were flawed ethically, and then proceed in your analysis of the article to reveal the questions that should have been asked by the REC in order to evaluate whether the research was scientifically sound. So my questions here are, um, to you, how then is it possible that this research or research proposal passed the ethical review at issue? And then to Professor Jansen, in light of the statement issued by the university, is this a case of science absolving itself of any wrongdoing? Uh, and how are these re researchers any different to any sparrow if the claim is that they didn't know any, be any better? So what should shield them or other researchers from the same public score. Uh, Professor Moodley. Thank you, Armand. So clearly from the report that you just read, which is the official conclusion of the investigation, it's very obvious that there's a contradiction between my chapter on the ethics of the research and the conclusions of the investigation. Um, uh, and um, you know, there, there were clearly um, indications in the project that should have alerted to the research, uh, alerted the research ethics committee to issues around race. Um, if a protocol is presented that is going to be conducted uh, uh, in, in, in Klutisvo, then uh, the committee that is based in Stellenbosch knows the Klutisvo area. So you ought to raise some questions about why this community and obviously, was there any community engagement? Um, there's also the issue around race appearing in a questionnaire in any research study. Uh, again, that's a red flag to a research ethics committee to ask why. And if that question was not asked, then the research ethics committee takes a, a great deal of responsibility in allowing the project to continue. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Jonathan, in response to the second part of the question, in light of the statement issued by the university, is it the case of science absolving itself of any wrongdoing? And if we consider the words that they were appalled initially and it was, uh, it was wrong, uh, how do you see that in relation to the book? And if, if we listen to Prof Moodley, um, surely there can't be two truths here. Yeah, I, I, I agree with uh, Professor Moodley's uh, position. Look, my, my point is, you know, that as South Africans, we really have to stop uh, throwing a easy foot every time an individual does something wrong, like an individual teacher does this horrific thing at uh, Parklands in Milneton to ask kids to draw up an advert uh, for fun uh, uh, about a slave auction. You know, and then we get angry and upset and so on, and, and that's fine. But that doesn't deal with the underlying issue of systemic racism. And so I felt that going for these, uh, Professor de Blanche and her colleagues stroke students was an important thing uh, to do in the context of academic, a rigorous academic response. But that's not your problem. Your problem is that the University of the Free State, the University of Pretoria, the University of Stellenbosch, the University of Cape Town are deeply mired in essentialist, in racial essentialism in the way they do research. Okay, uh, and you've seen that also in the Nikki Natvis article, though with a touch of, of, <laughs> of an English kind of, you know, uh, uh, racism. So I'm more interested in how do we deal with the systemic issues, because I guarantee you right now, that at Stellenbosch University, as at other universities, you will see more of these kinds of studies happening 
unless you deal with the fundamental issue of people's commitment, first of all, to seeing four races, but also seeing them hierarchically and seeing the one as more or less than the other. And unless you deal with those issues, as I said, uh, not just politically, but educationally, this kind of behavior will recur. So the study on colored women in and of itself is uninteresting. You know, it, 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 it turns your stomach, of course, it's, uh, it's insulting, it's all of that stuff. But if our reaction as academics, for example, is simply to do what the media does, which is to blow this up as a headline, and then two weeks later, we forgot about it, then of course, you're not going to solve anything. And that's as true in schools as it is in universities. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm going to um, move on to, I just want to check. At the center of this book, literally and figuratively, there's a chapter of Busters and Bastards that asks the question of whether we are here at this point because of a mere error in the biblical translation. It then goes further to discuss the politics of disgust and the politics of humanity. Um, I can't see at the moment if Prof. Klaassens is online, um, but she concludes the chapter alluding to change required at the level of the human heart. Um, and I just want to quote what, what she's written there. But I would also say resolve and commitment in addition to hard, dedicated work. And do not forget institutional will. Uh, if we look at this university statement, uh, where are we on this journey? Uh, Prof. Klaassen, if you are there. Um, yes, hello. I'm on. <laughs> Great. Um, so, so I've quoted you there, and I really loved that last little bit. And do not forget about uh, we need the resolve, the commitment, hard and dedicated work, because that's what we need when we deal with these sticky, tough issues. Um, and then not to forget the institutional world. Where are we as a university on this journey? Um, are you asking me also? Yes, 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 you, okay. yes, you. Okay, yeah, no, and I, and I um, really, I mean, as the Faculty of Theology, um, being also part of the oldest, um, one of the oldest faculty in this university, I think it's very appropriate that we take ownership also of the apartheid theology and how the Bible is read, I'm a professor and Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, so, um, we've been very much involved in also sort of the um, the racist um, undertones of this country. So I think for us at the Faculty of Theology, we are very much aware of that and try to teach our students to be different, to read different, I mean, that way. And I wrote that it's interesting about the institutional world because, I mean, I think, um, you know, because I've, most of my work is also in, in, in gender studies, of in gender, and I mean, I, I know it's so difficult um, for people um, to really want to change. I mean, I, I think, I mean, just um, how far we have come, we are still today fighting about childcare centers and not being having that, that fight has been going on for more than 20 years. So yeah, so I think, um, and I think uh, what you've mentioned even today also saying that even to like a book like this to be part of a core curriculum, I think we should have, like in the American context, um, that they say a, a, core, a course in which we uh, teach some of these um, important um, factors to all students, um, whether they're engineers, whether they are um, doctors, whether they are business um, at the business school. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed that chapter too. Um, Coming back to you, Jonathan, and you mentioned systemic racism. Uh, there's quite a challenging question here. I'm glad I don't have to face it, uh, but it might, uh, I'll read it. Um, it's anonymous. This may be an uncomfortable question, but I'm curious about the absence or near absence of apartheid-defined Black people in the speaker list and the author list, at least from what I could see online. Is this a situation that is peculiar to Stellenbosch? I'll leave that to one of the editors to field. I don't think the question is uncomfortable at all. I think we must ask these kinds of questions. <clears throat> and and uh, indeed, in the context of this uh, study, uh, we reached out to so many uh, colleagues and the ones who responded are the ones in the book. Uh, but I agree that is a commitment we must make, not just by the way, in terms of who, are the, who the authors are in the uh, context of um, uh, uh, of a book like this, but in the people we appoint, you know, as our students, as our postdocs, as our staff, 
uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the question is not uncomfortable at all. And we have to constantly be on our guard against that. I just noticed, by the way, let me just throw this in here to upset the apple cart, the ethnic apple cart. I see that uh, the University of Cape Town just published a report on the uh, death of the suicide death of Professor Bongani Mayosi, uh, uh, who was the Dean of Health Sciences. And here you have a study done by four black African people and nobody says that's unacceptable. For me, that's unacceptable in a diverse society, uh, et cetera. So we've got to be alert to, uh, to, to the question of inclusion. So I appreciate that question and it is taken uh, and received as, as valuable uh, criticism. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, I also, I'm going to say I enjoyed all the chapters, right? Uh, but there's something particularly about uh, Prof. Amanda Hose's uh, chapter, uh, Problematizing Race and Gender in Everyday Research, which I feel is sorely lacking within uh, the EMS, uh, uh, the Economic and Management Sciences. Uh, Prof. Hose, you suggest um, the importance of reflexivity and you make the point that feminist research ethic can improve scholarship. Can you just share a little bit more about what your views are there? Yes, thank you um, for the, the question. And um, I just want to take a step back and say that um, I, I agree with Jonathan about the fact that, you know, it's about education and so what preceded uh, the book was also a symposium um, on the main campus uh, that, that actually brought together scholars uh, for a day long debate um, on, on the issue of the sports science article. And so I think the, the book reflects um, a lot of what, what was said um, at the symposium, but, but I think what was important for me about that symposium is to make it a teaching moment rather than to, to um, punish the authors of the sports science article exactly because they were so surprised about what they, uh, about the reaction to the article. So I think it's really important that we do see this um, as, as a, a teaching moment and also that the book should be used much wider um, as a teaching tool. Uh, my chapter in the book um, deals with a feminist uh, research methodology and epistemology. And you know, if you're a feminist, um, feminists work from a, a position of a feminist praxis, which actually um, starts what we call from a standpoint perspective, so that no science, no research is value free. You, you acknowledge your values, but you also try to understand the values of the communities of what we call our research participants come from and, and the values that they hold and try to understand, try to put yourself in their shoes. And we also believe that you always give something back to the communities you work with. So you, you share your research results and you show them what you found and, and that they can own part of the process. And I think this is really important because very often when we as academics do research, we go into communities, we gather data and we never give something back. Um, that is self-reflexivity. It's, it's self-reflexivity about your own values, your own positionality in, uh, in society. You know, we come uh, as, as academics from positions of power and we have to acknowledge that power. Um, you know, science always, research always include positions of power and the researchers are in the position of power. So you have to acknowledge that. And um, so that's really very important. And I really think it, you know, it's not only feminists that should adhere to these types of processes, but it should apply to, um, to everyone, you know, every researcher. Um, Sandra Harding, who's a, a research theorist, um, a feminist theorist who, who works on epistemology, has argued that, you know, if, if we take sort of the, what we call positive res, positivist researches, you, you stand outside and you look in and you say, oh, I, you know, I don't, my values don't influence this, I'm objective. But you can only have what she calls strong objectivity if you acknowledge where you come from, your own position and your values. So 
and I really think that, you know, both with the sports science article and the situation um, at UCT at the moment is that they, that authors need to reflect um, on their own values and specifically uh, because race is such an important dimension uh, in the South African society. The, the fact that we, we categorize people as, as Jonathan has said uh, in categories, but also in hierarchies that we need to reflect about how that influence us when we do research. So, so I think, you know, if you're interested in, in that type of process, then my chapter would be quite helpful. Go Thanks on. a lot, Prof. Prof. Um, let's move on. Um, there's so much in this book that you, you really need to get. We'll share the details of where it's available. Um, so let me move on to uh, Prof. Uh, Muller and Froneman, uh, Jonathan mentioned the interesting aspect of music um, and they delve into, if you're a jazz lover, um, a, a, a unique insight that they deliver on, on uh, jazz and its influence. Um, Prof Miller or Froneman, can you just share with us the influence that music has had in creating a voice or a tone within uh, Stellenbosch University, reinforcing these uh, barriers that we have in terms of race. Um, my colleague, Wilhelmine, thank you, Armand. My colleague, Wilhelmine, has just uh, informed me a microphone doesn't work that well, so I'll answer. Um, well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll answer by, by just, uh, telling a little anecdote of an exchange that I've just had this week uh, on campus. And the exchange uh, went as follows. A new uh, module was being proposed, a BA module uh, for um, students entering into a BBA course to take a subject of the music department uh, that would be um, not music specific, i.e. not for music specialists. And the conversation, um, the objections to this raised within in the department, amongst other things, said um, things like gender and race are fads, right? fashionable. We, what we should really be sticking to is uncontested materials like J.S. Bach and Franz Schubert. I, I really don't have much more to say than that. If you want to ask me, uh, how has it been uh, embedded uh, in Stellenbosch University? That's how. Yeah, I found very interesting the comments around the um, the annual that was delivered, um, where there was no mention of apartheid um, and its influence. Um, maybe you just want to uh, reflect on that for us and just share a little bit about that. Well, uh, the university department is the oldest university department in South Africa. It published a fest schrift uh, commemorating this existence um, uh, about a decade ago. And it, um, uh, we quote in the chapter, a review of this fest schrift by Professor Chris Walton, um, a colleague of mine who now works and lives in Switzerland. I believe Jonathan, you know him from the University of Pretoria. And Chris uh, uh, noted that um, there was no mention in this book commemorating a hundred years of music at Stellenbosch that for most of that hundred years, only white people were allowed to study music. Um, and so uh, if you look at the building itself uh, completed in 1978, uh, Chris was instrumental in pointing out to me that the building had been designed for white people. I mean, there were two uh, non-white toilets uh, of which the signs were only removed about a decade ago. They just had little stickers on them. So all across, it's not only in the curricula, it's not only in the idea of what you see as marked um, as central to a university curriculum, i.e. Bach or Schubert or Mozart, where you see uh, the commitment to racial thinking, it's really in the bricks and mortar. Thanks, uh, Prof. Muller. I just want to read this quote because I found it really intriguing. What is more, the value of white expressive culture becomes inextricably in entwined with professing the danger of the black other 
in these ecstatic terms. In this sense, and you must forgive me, I think it's Gerke's racial musical fantasies constitute morbidly ghoulish attempts at cobbling together a white, not black, musical Frankenstein. I really enjoyed that quote. Um, I'd like to move on because we're running short of time here. Um, to Cecilia, I know she doesn't want to speak, but I want to share what was really interesting about this uh, chapter. Um, it was endearing in that she shares a personal account of non-racialism and then encounters in her own house a different generation and their views on it. And I want to, to, to just quote um, what her daughter says to her. I will not deprive myself of all this because the word does not sit lecker in some intellectuals' mouths. And I thought that's quite an interesting dynamic to have in a house where it is that one person does not want to identify with that term um, and uh, the others are looking at the erasure of culture and how losing that term is going to mean something else. Cecilia, I don't know if you are there, but I'd really like to hear you say something if you would. Okay, um, Armand, you're putting me on the spot here. Um, but I think, yes, what, what, what it made clear to me was the importance of these intergenerational conversations because I was a scholar um, in the 70s, I was a student in the 80s, and I had grown up with a particular view and a particular set of understandings of that word colored. Um, and here I found um, a new generation, in, a generation from which my own daughter had come, um, that was understanding it in a very different way and in a way that needed to be engaged. Um, and yeah, and so for me, it was it was a real a real mind shift. I wasn't even entertaining those kinds of views, you know, that actually there might be a place for it, that there were issues of representativity and erasure and issues of identity that needed to be taken into account. Um, so without um, shifting from my own position, um, I was able to engage a different set of understandings that I think a different generation or one different to my own was bringing to the term colored. So I think that for me was the important message is that actually when you, and, and even within my home, I have three generations. I have my mom who comes from even further back. Um, and even those intergenerational conversations are so important. And I think that's how one moves and, and, and shifts, um, has, does the work of mind shifting. It's a very important aspect that we talk across generations. I think there's, there's quite an important bit that, that goes on to what your daughter says. And I'm just going to, to read because I do want to say two of these words on a platform like this. Uh, by refusing validity to the name and therefore the lexicon that speaks to the specificity of that human experience. Words such as ohat, dala, and other phrases that give expression specific to a community. The way that it can play into healing is also removed. And I think that's such a poignant point that, that, that is made there is that we focus so much on the negative aspects, but there's also this opportunity for healing. Absolutely. Um, we're pushed for time. Unfortunately, it seems like, you know, when there is a topic that requires a, um, a real proper discussion, uh, there's another room that's going to be used, but at this point, uh, Jonathan and uh, Cyril, um, I'd like for you to take the opportunity really just to wrap up and give us a sense of what this process has been like um, for you as a group of authors um, and where it is that you see this book having and leaving a, a impact um, on the University of Stellenbosch. So I'll, I'll give that time to you. Um, to do the wrapping up for us. Um, Cyril, would you go first? Um, okay. Um, I just want to, to talk quickly to the contemporary decision-making course that I teach on at the USB, because I see in the chat that the leadership development course gets a, a punt, but you know, the USB has moved the curriculum to being more socially conscious and in contemporary decision-making in our first two three sessions, we deal with issues of race. We do case studies and we talk about these difficult issues. 
So I think that across the complete curriculum of the MBA, there is a shift towards more critical issues, getting our students to know that it's not only about the hard management sciences. And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of where we've gone with the curriculum as such. And so I'm my, it, it, it is the goal that I will bring the, this book into, into that course as well, and that it does get the reach that it does. So, and, and Jonathan, I'll hand over to you, but that it, you know, from the USB that it gets into a core curriculum on main campus as well. That's the impact we want. We want students within the medical sciences, the economic sciences that you know that these issues exist and you need to be able to deal with them. Mm. Uh, thank you, Cyril. I, I just want to say that uh, there's one thing we haven't talked about, and it's a very important issue. So maybe I'll conclude with that. And that is, uh, should white people be studying black people? And I tell you where I'm coming from on this. The, 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 the real danger, I think, in the Tablanche study and the Natris study is not that they were studying, you know, people other than white people, um, but that there wasn't, there were three elements missing in that approach, their approaches to research, which I mentioned in my Times column. The one is self-awareness. When you study other people, you know, in this power relationship that is inevitable, as Amanda put it, uh, correctly put it, if there's no self-awareness of yourself as a white person, as a person of privilege, as a person of advantage, as a person coming from within an institution with incredible power over the research subject, I use that term deliberately, then you're in danger already, regardless of what you do. Secondly, if you're not able to approach the subject of study with what I call intellectual humility, that is, I come to the people of Glittersburg, I come to the students, at UCT with a sense of, I don't really know what you're going through. I don't really know. There's no instrument in the universe of methods, okay, that can give a white person the complete insight into a very complex thing like people's career and occupational choices. There isn't such a thing. So I enter with an intellectual humility. I did a study on white Afrikaans youth at, at Turkey's. Half the time I was, talking to my colleagues who understood what it means. Uh, people like uh, uh, Alta Engelbrecht, people like J.C. van der Merwe, people who could you know, provide in, in technical terms of validation of what I as a black person was trying to understand uh, coming in. You've got to come in with intellectual humility. And thirdly, you've got to come in with an incredible amount of social and political caution. You are on thin ice, okay? And, and the, the problem with the responses of both de Blanche uh, and, and Natris um, uh, isn't that they shouldn't be studying you know, uh, other people, is that they are completely unaware, both in the crude form of racism in the de Blanche study and the more sophisticated form of racism in the Natris study. Uh, um, they're completely unaware of how their language itself and complicit in the state of oppressed peoples. And that is also something that I think the book tries to, yeah. to, to address. Finally, I think we would make a really, really solid progress. I know the Senate and Amanda is a senior member of the Senate of Stellenbosch, as is Albert Grundling and others. I really appeal to you guys to press this issue at the Senate level that the book becomes part of a core curriculum that addresses issues on the politics of race, the politics of identity, in order to make sure that another generation doesn't repeat the mistakes that we've made. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, thank you very much to all the authors. I, I might not have mentioned all of you if you are online. I truly appreciate the fact that all of you have taken the time to be here. Unfortunately, um, we're pressed for time to the editors, uh, to Max, to Ferial, to Pitt. Thank you very much for all of uh, your contributions. Uh, to Rishana, who's been behind the scenes and making sure that all the tech is happening. Um, and to Nadia for pulling it all together uh, from this side. 
Um, so thank you very much to everybody. Please check in the chat box before you disappear. The book is available there and the challenge is out for those at a higher level. Take care. Armand, Be and stay safe. Armand yes. from our side, yes. thank you. Thank you for taking this initiative. Um, I'm happy that you declared your your uh, struggle credentials today. I thought uh, I just appointed an ordinary academic. Now I know there's a problem in my room, but I'll deal with you afterwards. No, thanks very much. Uh, jokes aside, Armand, for, for, for setting this up. Fantastic. Um, I am a believer that gestalt switches or paradigm changes can happen through education. I'm positive. Thank you so much to everyone. Bye. We'll make it happen. Take Thank care. You. Be safe. Bye. Thank you.